Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for your patience while we, we navigate some tech stuff. Um, so as mentioned, my name's Hannah, um, Hannah Bray. I work at the Old Bray Mission, which is a large homeless service provider in Quebec, um, in Jijagi or Montreal, part of the larger Kanyugahaka. Um, and today I'm talking about developing a successful Canadian rent bank model for eviction prevention, and we're going to be talking about international lessons and promising practices. Um, if my coworker runs in suddenly, I'll let him take over, um, but for now I think you're stuck with me. So quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about, or hopefully we. Um, some context to maybe situate where this project comes from, thinking about eviction prevention and rent banks, how to kind of situate those things together typology of rent banks, some political context that it's actually quite pertinent to thinking about these things, um, methods, and then I'll go over some case studies and then get to the good stuff, which is uh, effectiveness and promising practices. So context being, again, I work at the Oldbury Mission, large homeless service provider. Um, in Quebec, we are incredibly behind the times when it comes to prevention, even on a Canadian scale. Uh, prevention is in many ways a new word uh, in Montreal, I think, for the way we do service provision. Um, I say that openly to engage with sort of thinking critically about how we do our work. Um, for us, it's, it's something relatively new. My colleague has only been the director of prevention, which is a new department for the last couple of years. Um, research at the Oldbury Mission, however, has been for over a decade. Um, we've been doing this, I think, since 2010. And really, it's about developing effective mo models, really creating an evidence base for what we do that you know is, is grounded in best practice and taking the experiences we're collecting when we do service provision um, and thinking critically about that. So I have the privilege as the research coordinator to kind of lead that. Um, in the research department, this came about as developing a pilot project for a Quebec rent bag model. So as we're entering the um, prevention game, one thing that we were toiling with is this idea of a rent bank. It's not something that's really done in Montreal. It's not really something that's done in Quebec. And it's certainly not something that we have a lot of evidence to think critically about. So we said, okay, let's really think about it. And we developed a project with the University of Toronto to gather not just, um, you know, sort of locally what is thinking about this, but globally, what do these kinds of interventions look like and what's do being done best? Um, so yeah, it's developing promising practices and, you know, thinking about how can we do this at Ulbury Mission or maybe advocate for it at a larger scale. So to kind of situate it, um, I know I'm being very critical here, and there's some people who are doing a much better job than us uh, on this, but Canada is slow to take up a real prevention approach to homelessness. Um, and eviction prevention, I think, is one big avenue, and a big part of sort of the challenges to that is, is that we're all having to confront um, the private rental market when we're doing that. And that's kind of the tough thing, is to tackle the actual market actors. And in truth, really, we're not doing a great job at that. Um, as kind of the crisis has been outlined many times, um, even in this first day at the conference. There's a decreasing availability of affordable housing with extreme rank increases, making it more challenging for households to find stable housing when they're evicted, um, making them more at risk of homelessness. So we're increasingly in crisis interventions where we might not have been before because that sort of fine line of precarity has increased for so many households in Canada. Um, rent banks are generally considered secondary or crisis level interventions uh, when we look at the literature. There's not a lot in the peer-reviewed literature when we talk about these kinds of models. Um, but what does come up in sort of prevention typology is that this isn't really where you want to be getting into the, the game when you're thinking more macro scale of how to handle a housing crisis, right? It's much more in a crisis uh, level, and I'll talk more about that afterwards. Um, so really, ideally, support happens before rent bank is accessed or even considered if we're looking at program design. Um, countries with especially poor system level supports for primary interventions are heavily reliant on these kinds of programs. And I'll get more into that in a sec. So we created a sort of typology of rent banks. And this is important because when we're thinking about something about like an emergency rental assistance program or just anything that's like a pool of money that we take to cover somebody's rent arrears, the typology of that differs radically across the world. So what we could ascertain, this is not an exhaustive typology, but if we're kind of looking at our research questions and objectives, these are sort of the ones that were the most interesting to us. Rent banks, this is an exclusively Canadian term. When we got into the literature and when we were access, um, 
asking the question to some of our international peers who are really interested in prevention, what do you guys think of rent banks? They looked at us and said, come again? Um, so this is just a term we use here, and it really designates often enough sort of the more ground level intervention that these kind of programs provide. Um, versus if we see other programs, Typology 2, things like eviction diversion, emergency rental assistance fund, homelessness prevention, housing stability services, rent relief, et cetera. These are programs typically found in contexts like the United States or UK, where there's a much bigger funding pool that comes down generally from the federal entity and then trickles down into smaller entities. So Canada, and I'll get more into this afterwards, we go bottom up um, when this specific intervention happens versus um, other countries, it seems to be more top down. The third one, and I just want to mention this, I won't really be able to get much more into it, there's also legislative rent bank models. So for example, in Italy, if you are brought to court um, for rent arrears, um, and the court finds you to be under a certain set of circumstances, they can take public funds to cover your rent arrears. Um, and so I wanted to mention this because I think in this sort of context, we often look at it as service providers, municipalities, having a pool of funds, but there are other contexts where this is just built into the legislative system. So that's interesting too. The political context when we got into the literature seemed to be really, really important to how these programs were designed, governed, implemented, you name it. It really seemed to follow very specific political lines. So I talked about it before, poor systems level supports, um, for example, the United States, with all due respect to American colleagues in the room, um, we're looking at an extremely neoliberal context where something like a rent bank is kind of the ideal intervention because you're focusing the intervention really on the household level. You have these funds that come up from the feds and trickle down, but really it's the idea that you as a household should be still responsible for your housing and this remains your responsibility. But we're going to make this little intervention to kind of hope that you don't become homeless. But it doesn't impact the landlord. Um, in, in any sort of immediate sense in that we're not saying to the landlord, well, you can't charge more or you can't evict this person. We're just saying you still have to be able to pay, right? So it doesn't infringe on a landlord's right under a free market logic, um, and it often emerges under emergency crisis circumstances. So in the United States, as an example, the emergency rental assistance program um, emerged during COVID, and this was a really interesting, really flexible fund where states were given a pool of money to distribute to people whose uh, livelihood had been impacted by COVID and they were at risk of losing their housing. And it was very flexible in terms of its definition for most states. Um, so we also see um, places with very strong system level supports, and this is kind of the opposite side of the pendulum. Places like Poland and Finland, um, we don't actually see a lot of rent banks. And the reason for that being is, is that the primary prevention is done in such a way that they, they don't really have many of them the same way and it, it, it works out well. For example, Poland has extremely stringent tenant protection laws that make for that somebody's necessity to actually access a pool of money like this would, might actually be quite limited. Very structural supports, um, you know, being like the example in Poland, but if we get to Finland, um, we're looking at you know, people having access to a certain level of housing that probably makes for that they wouldn't necessarily be in a situation where they'd be in private market rental housing needing this kind of intervention in the first place. Then we get to mixed level supports and some, you know, political scientists nerds might argue with me, that's fine. Um, if we think about Canada still operating under this very neoliberal ideology, but with some stronger system level supports, for example, if we're comparing to the United States, we still see that we don't have the sort of top-down approach of funding rent banks like they do in the United States, but we see it coming more from a crisis level from the service providers, from the municipalities, more ground up, where it's smaller governments or smaller entities that are saying we need to invest in this because those structural supports aren't strong enough. So it, one way of, of conceptualizing these programs, I think, is sort of helpful to think about why they operate the way they do. Methods, really quickly, we ran a literature review. There's very little peer-reviewed literature on this content. Um, we looked at emergency rental and mortgage assistance models under all of their names. Um, we looked at gray literature on the case studies we were interested in and anything else that sort of emerged through that. Um, and we also collected all the internal documents that people who participated in our semi-structured interviews gave us. Um, that kind of bolstered our literature review. Obviously, it was done with their consent. Um, Semi-structured interviews, service providers were contacting Canada, US, and UK for in-person meetings. We tried as much as possible to go where people would be accessing these programs to see what it was like. You know, what kind of context was this? Was this really where you were accessing something almost like a shelter? 
Um, was it just when you were accessing other sort of social supports? Like, what did this feel like? What was the experience of trying to access this kind of program? Um, and research questions really focused on governance, eligibility, function, and efficiency of programs. Um, so yeah, and we spoke with service providers, so uh, not service users, but people who were administering the program. So the first case study I want to bring up is Toronto. For those of you who live in Canada, who are familiar with the, these sorts of programs, you've probably heard of the Toronto Rent Bank. Um, it was a big subject in the recent mayoral uh, debates when they, they had their election. Um, but it started off in the late 90s really as a specific pilot program for single mothers. It has obviously expanded um, to have far more inclusion. Um, the funding is provided to cover rent arrears, and it's really an emergency measure. And this is something particular that we'll see that differs across programs, where it's like in Toronto, it's really meant to be a stopgap solution. Ideally, you should be still be able to pay your rent, and when you're working with a case manager through this, they want to see that in any other circumstance, you would still be able to pay your rent. This is just a, an emergency situation that requires you need a little bit of a, a help just this month. Um, it's administered through a central organization as well as community partners, so it started off that one organization and then they have caseworkers who work with other smaller organizations in the GTA to administer this program. Participants fill out an intake form with a rent bank worker and then their file is assessed. Um, it started off as a loan, which I think is really interesting about this program, and during COVID it became a grant and the par program participation exploded, obviously. You went back from saying, you know, you're going to have to pay this back to, no, we're just giving you the money. With that, it's interesting, service providers in this particular instance had kind of ambiguous feelings about whether or not it should be a loan or a grant, where with a loan they were saying, well, the thing is is that the money was coming back to the rent bank, so we had more money to support more households if people were paying us back. It was an interest-free loan, they could pay it back pretty much at their own rate, and additionally, having people pay us back allowed us to integrate more wraparound supports. So because there was a person who was contacting this person saying, hey, your 20 bucks is due this month, whatever. It allowed them to say, also, how's it going? Do you need any other support? Um, and so that was their point of contact with people and they were able to sort of gauge how people were faring once they had actually accessed this program. The counter of that logic, and obviously we see this with other programs, is why are you asking people who were unable to pay this rent to pay this money back? They didn't have it in the first place, why would they have it to pay it back to you? So the funder largely determines eligibility and rules. So the city of Toronto, um, there's a fair amount of frontline discretion. There is a certain amount of, you know, the big red button that you can push when you say, you don't meet the eligibility criteria, but you definitely need this program. But our interview showed that that sometimes could be kind of nebulous. It was unclear when that big red button got to be pushed and if it could be pushed, and it seemed to sort of depend on who. Um, and, you know, application of rules and eligibility criteria can be kind of problematic. The next case study, for those of you, once again, who are familiar with this kind of program, you've probably heard of Homebase. I don't believe the same Homebase. No, exactly, different Homebase. Um, but Homebase uh, New York City is a larger homelessness prevention program. Um, the grant is a key part of it, and it's really focused on paying arrears. It's accessed through specific homelessness service providers throughout New York City. It's trickle-down funds that come through federal, state, and city government, and there are funds injected at each level to really have one targeted intervention on New York City. Um, households must be below 2% range of national median income, which for those of you who are familiar with the cost of living in New York City is absurd that you'd have to be so low income, um, so extremely rigid eligibility criteria, or you have to have demonstrated experience of little homelessness, which by a New York State um, essentially means that you can prove you have spent a night in a shelter, or you have a police report indicating that you uh, were sleeping outside, or you sign an affidavit saying, yes, I was absolutely homeless. Um, and you have to be at imminent risk of eviction, but based on New York State, tenant protection laws can be kind of also kind of ambiguous. It covers the entirety of your rent arrears. So if you apply, you're eligible, their goal is to put you at zero, is to pay up whatever you owe. And it is renewable every 45 days, as many times as necessary. So as long as you remain eligible, you can be back there every 45 days and have your rent arrears paid by this. Um, and as some service providers indicated to me, given especially how expensive New York City is, they said there are kids who have grown up under home base. 
um, where this is how the rent is paid. So compared to Toronto, where we have very much a stopgap solution, we have New York City that's, this is a rolling solution, uh, even if its implementation was meant to be maybe more temporary. The other program in New York City is the Municipal, municipal Emergency Rental Loan, also known as the one-shot deal. Um, as the name suggests, it's a one-time, interest-free loan to cover rent arrears. So we're back in the loan model. The thing about this loan is, is that it is interest-free. It is not attached to your credit score. There is no one who's going to come get you if you don't pay it. And yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a loan. Um, anyone at risk of eviction and homelessness can apply, so the eligibility criteria is much wider, but you can only access it once. It's provided by the municipality, um, and like I said, it's, there's no follow-up. Um, it's meant to precede accessing home base, so that's a key component that basically service providers will say, well, have you tried the one-time shot deal? Um, and a lot of people will try and circumvent it because regardless of whether or not no one's following you to pay it, um, it still remains that it's a loan, and loans can be scary, especially if you're somebody who's financially precarious. The model of it be can still be kind of problematic. Um, some discontinued programs that are also in New York City, there was the Project Parachute, which was an interesting project where um, during the pandemic they took a bunch of money from uh, private developers in New York City, put together a pool of funds to have a much more flexible eviction prevention fund for people um, with no status. So majority of these programs, well, all of these programs I've already mentioned, are only for people with formal status. Um, and there's a lot of people experiencing housing instability in New York City who do not have status and so don't have a privilege to access these programs. So Project Parachute was really interesting for that. Um, the other one, like I mentioned, was the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. This was a nationwide program that was then delivered to different states. Um, and so they were given sort of reign of what to do with it, but it was a more flexible fund for people who'd been affected, uh, had their income affected by COVID. Last case study is Wales. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with more of the, the prevention stuff, you'll know that Wales is often seen as kind of like this, this beacon. Um, I, this program is really interesting. I do think there's some interesting caveats. Um, so Wales is also operating in the, this context where they're getting funds from Westminster and they don't have control over all of their programs. So um, while they have this really awesome, more comprehensive prevention act called the Housing Wales Act, um, they're still dealing with some of like those higher level funding uh, issues, if you will. So the first program is the discretionary housing payments. Um, this can be accessed by those living in council housing or private rental market. Council housing is a, a form of social housing um, in the UK. For those of you who are not familiar with councils, um, they're kind of like the um, social services hubs that are located in different neighborhoods um, that are funded sort of across the UK. Um, so they're dispersed by the councils. You have to be in council housing or private market housing. Um, and once again, very much like Toronto, this is a short-term conditions associated with working towards housing st stabilization. So you actually have to prove to your caseworker, I'm going to get this money, but here's my plan for never having to access it again, which can be, you know, kind of paternalizing. Um, it's not everybody's favorite approach to this. Um, it's for those already accessing the housing benefit, so you're kind of already in the system. This isn't necessarily for somebody who you know, lost their job one day and said, oh shoot, I'm not gonna be able to pay my rent. Um, so, you know, it's not very flexible. The eligibility criteria can be kind of rigid. The Homelessness Prevention Grant, which I think has now been discontinued, was specifically provided by the Welsh government, so it's a different funding pool. It was much more flexible, and it was like funds within a given year to, to, for prevention. So prevention didn't have to be rent arrears. It could be, if you had a landlord saying, I'm going to have to evict these tenants, if I can't fix the fire escape. And they go, okay, well, here's some money to fix the fire escape, keep your tenants. Um, it's a flexible funds, but generally it was used for, to cover rent arrears. Um, one thing that's important about this under the Housing Wales Act was that neither of these things can exist as a loan. Um, under the Housing Wales Act, if you're giving these sort of funds, it absolutely has to be a grant. Housing Wales Act is under the understanding if somebody didn't have the money last month, they're not going to have it next month to pay you back. Some prompting, pro promising practices we can kind of glean looking at the evidence. Um, we have to really have a careful consideration of loan versus grant models. Um, you know, this is sort of implying what I've said here. Wraparound services. For those of us in service provision, we know that the financial intervention is generally not the only thing that a household needs. We need a balance between frontline discretion, flexible programming, and strong governance structure. So again, this idea of like there's some discretion on the part of the person administering the service, but it also has to be backed by clear structure 
um, and good communication with your funder. So we need continuous funding, um, and if you're gonna put more money into your rent bank, this is something we saw across models, you also need to put money in your human resources. More often than not, money was put into the pool of funds for housing, but it didn't necessarily accompany more staff to administer those funds, so that's important. Um, you need streamlined open discussion, like I said, um, and we think about effective models for keeping people housed. There's a tension between the programming model and the fact that housing conditions are constantly changing. So you need to be able to adapt this program as things go. Um, and we need to focus on the real issue, which is cost of housing. So last slide, I promise. Uh, housing continues to be more expensive. We have insufficient social housing options. Emergency cash programs are becoming the norm. We're gonna have to start thinking critically about this regardless of whether or not these are the ideal interventions when we're thinking about prevention. Uh, rent bank type models are increasingly crucial in that sense, um, but we need more research to really assess these programs and support their development critically and thinking, is this really what we want? And if it is, how can we make it the best? Um, and big picture, rent banks should be a last resort. Primary prevention as, uh, is the way to go if we can. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Continuous funding, that's a surprise for everybody in this room. Uh, next up, we have Sasha, Adriana, and Chris talking about housing problem solving. The floor is yours. All set up? Yeah, I'll try okay. Right Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you Hannah for that queue up actually the political context is I think informative for our session too and I want to before we dive into housing problem solving in Santa Clara County I want to provide some additional local context for what we'll be talking about and um, Santa Clara County for folks who are unfamiliar is in the heart of Silicon Valley and it is a two million person county in California and there are about on any given night about 10,000 folks experiencing homelessness and so we're talking about um, and it includes 15 cities and um, so we're talking about a pretty large scale system and there are a lot of uh, homeless service providers working together to address homelessness in the community and there's a strategic plan that I think you can go to the next slide and skip that one so we're specifically talking about housing problem solving which is a small piece of a larger strategic plan in the community and there are three pillars to that plan and the first pillar is really focused on addressing the root causes of homelessness so through uh, making housing affordable housing development easier changing zoning laws increasing rental um, rental protections and the second pillar where housing problem solving lives is to uh, expand and improve the supportive housing system. So we're specifically gonna be talking about housing problem solving, but it also includes supportive housing. And the third piece is making, uh, making the quality of life for folks that are unsheltered uh, better because there is a lot of unsheltered homelessness in Santa Clara County. So actually just go back a little bit, stay here for now, yeah. So housing problem solving, we, uh, I mentioned that we have about 10,000 folks experiencing homelessness and through our coordinated access system, there's maybe 25 to 30% of folks who are referred to supportive housing programs. So that leaves out a great majority of folks experiencing homelessness. And so housing problem solving is meant to provide 
services and to provide flexible financial assistance for folks who may never get prioritized and referred to housing through the coordinated access system. And it's really focused on identifying the most immediate, temporary, and permanent solution for someone who is either at risk of falling into homelessness or someone who's showing up at the shelter door already or showing up at drop-in services. So it's the first, first touch intervention, the first service that they receive is to see, all right, what networks, what resources do you have that can help address the situation immediately so that we can prevent someone from entering homelessness to begin with? And it's really focused on a strengths-based approach that meets the person where they're at. And Chris and Adriana will dig into what that means um, in a, just a little bit and share some examples of working with clients. Uh, but it's focused on counseling and also financial assistance. And we'll talk about some of the creative uses of financial assistance. So we'll also talk about how housing problem solving is systematized because as I mentioned, we are working in the context of a very large homeless population and a lot of providers working together. So this isn't just one agency providing housing problem solving services. This is, um, Chris and Adriana will talk about it a little bit from a hotline perspective. This is also a program that is systematized uh, and is rolling out across shelters. It's something that is in the future also going to be provided by outreach. And um, the idea is that it prevents shelter resources or it saves shelter resources for folks who have otherwise have nowhere else to go. And it's the quickest intervention available through the system where housing placement can take a while and shelters are running at capacity and that can take a while as well. And as I mentioned, it can be applied at any touch point. So the idea is that housing problem solving is getting rolled out broader and broader so that no matter where someone shows up for services, this is the first thing that the provider does to try to resolve their homelessness immediately. All right, thank you, Sasha, for all that information. Um, so I'm the program supervisor for our hotline and housing problem solving program. So I really look at the day to day. I look at financial requests. I speak to clients. I speak to my staff, and we talk about you know what's happening and how can we help these people. So here is a look at kind of like how we get our clients and our workflow. So number one, so we are the call center. Um, we are signing people up for shelter. That is pretty much the primary reason why people are giving us a call because they're looking for shelter or even resources. We just heard about um, homeless prevention. We give that resource a lot to clients or anything else they really need to go find a meal, to go find clothes. Um, how do I sign up for benefits? We try to guide them into the right direction um, at the call center. So we have clients calling in, we have caseworkers calling in, we have shelters calling in, first responders calling in, anyone and everyone's calling in to the hotline. And so first we're gonna speak with the client, we're gonna screen their situation. This is where they're screened for housing problem solving. So not every single client that calls in is gonna be selected for the housing problem solving program. That is because right now we are doing a research study with the University of Notre Dame. And so some clients get selected for treatment, other clients get um, selected as control so they won't be getting any treatment. Um, right now, 65% of clients that call in are getting selected. So we are helping quite a bit of people um, along with the housing problem solving assessment, we're also doing a triage assessment because since this client is calling in looking for shelter, if we're not able to divert them from shelter through housing problem solving, they're still going to be eligible to go to shelter and still get that, um, still be eligible for that assistance at the shelter. So hopefully they can rapidly exit the shelter as well. 
And so, you know, we do have a system, we call it HMIS, that we use for like our county. It's a countywide system where we collect a release of information form. So that allows us, you know, to just get their name, their date of birth, their, you know, how long have you been homeless? Where have you been living? Do you have any income? Um, a lot of background information to see how we can assist them further. Uh, okay, and then the next part is where a referral comes in. So if clients are not able to be diverted or use a housing problem solving program, we do send shelter referrals. And so we have a team that works on single males, single women and families. And our team goes down that list every single day depending on the availability that we get from shelters and calls clients, asks them, would you like to accept this shelter? We're looking at a lot of different things. We're looking at, um, do they need a bottom bunk bed? Do they have a pet? Where do they get most of their services? You know, a client doesn't necessarily want to go to the Gilroy shelter, um, which is like an hour away from like our main city where people go to the social security office or their doctor is, um, things like that. So we just call them, get more information, keep up with them. Maybe they want to go to a women and family shelter because they've had past trauma with males, that sort of thing. And so we send the referral to the shelter provider when we have that availability. And then we also offer transportation to the shelter if needed. So even if it, you know, even if they have to do an intake and they give us a call like three days later saying like, hey, I got an intake for next week, we'll provide that transportation for them or same day. So we also have same day placement that the client arrives by the end of the day. And then if we send a referral, that the client doesn't go that same day. They're, the shelter should be responding between 24 to 72 hours to confirm an intake date. Do they need transportation? Do you have a dog? What kind of limitations do you have? Can you climb stairs? That sort of thing. Next slide. Here I kind of get into it a little bit more, like a, a little bit more in depth into like our workflow. So when clients are calling in, we're always gonna wanna screen for domestic violence first and foremost, because if a client's looking for those resources, then we're gonna um, direct them somewhere else to our domestic violence organizations. Because we try to get people into the shelter as fast as we can. Unfortunately, our shelters are just regular shelters. And then, you know, if a client has a profile, then we go ahead, look them up by their name and their date of birth. If they don't have a profile, we do make that for them in order to have a profile. You can be an anonymous client in our system. It does make it hard for the coordinated entry system. If, you know, if there's someone from Santa Clara County that's looking on our on our database and is ready to offer, you know, like a rapid rehousing voucher or other services, they are not able to reach out to them if they are an anonymous profile. So getting that release of information form is really, really important for the client um, to get further services throughout the county. And then we're gonna enroll our client into um, our hotline project. And so we're gonna first do our enrollment and then after enrollment, we do the housing problem solving assessment. And so here, it, this is where it depends on if a client can even be put through. We call it a lottery because not every client is selected. So depending on where you answer, like where you've been living, you can either be put into that lottery to be selected for the program or not. So if I were to call in and I tell the operator on the other line, like, yeah, like I've, I've been living for a friend for the past week, or maybe I say, you know, I've been renting for the past year, but I have a 30 day eviction notice. Those clients are not eligible to be, to be put through the lottery for housing problem solving services, because we would direct them to our homeless prevention services in, in our area. And so it is randomized, so clients are selected randomly. And so clients are selected for housing problem solving. Then we refer them to our queue, which is basically like a list of clients that are either select, that are selected. Clients that are not selected don't get put into a list in our system. And then we provide housing problem solving services to our clients. And so this looks very different. The most success that we have found is that we're either, someone comes to us and they're in a place where they can, you know, they're ready to be housed, but maybe they don't have the funds for a deposit or first month's rent. And that's where we're able to step in and help clients. I think like myself, I've been able to help clients in a day 
they come to us and they're ready. I've helped clients that work at our shelters, actually. And so because they just need that little bit of assistance, we're able to do that for them. Um, another thing that we see typically with helping clients is going back to the strength-based approach. We look at, you know, who is in their circle? Who are they already connected to? What have they been doing so far to try to help their situation? And how can we build off of that? So a lot of the times it is family. It is friends. So we do that as well. We help clients, you know, be able to stay with family and friends. We can help financially through grocery assistance, utility assistance, things like that. Those are the two most common uh, avenues that we go towards to help clients. Of course, there's like a lot of other things that we could do as well, but it all has to be tied back to housing. So if someone is wanting to go live with their mom in Oklahoma and they have a car to get there, but they don't have enough gas, maybe we're going to help them with gas money to get there because that, you know, knowing the end point is going to be housing for that client. So we either are able to do housing problem solving successfully and the client is stably rehoused or housing problem solving might be unsuccessful and the client is still needing uh, shelter placement. And so that kind of goes into like, let's say a client is not selected for housing problem solving, then we wouldn't be having that conversation with them. We wouldn't be diving deeper with them into what they need other than shelter. Um, they would basically be on our wait list waiting for us to call them with shelter placement. Of course, if clients are needing you know, more assistance, then we're there as the hotline to be able to give them those resources that they're needing. You know, maybe a client needs help um, finding a organization to help them with social security, disability, then we lead them in that direction and hopefully get the ball rolling for them to be able to get that assistance. Or we have something in our county called a VSPDAT. It's basically just an assessment. I see head nods. Cool. Okay, so it's basically just an assessment where clients... Um, they get like rated with like a number and you're either in a rapid rehousing range or a permit supportive housing range. Some clients need that more than, you know, just a little bit of money for deposit and first month's rent or to be able to live with a family member because a lot of them may not have family members. They may be chronically homeless or, you know, maybe their family is not supportive, any, any number of things. So then a client is not selected for housing problem solving. We do the um, shelter triage for them. We refer them to the appropriate queue. So that could either be a household with children or a household without children. And then we refer them to an emergency shelter. All right, everybody. My name is Chris and Tiana. I'm the director for the Here For You hotline. So I manage the whole call, um, call center along with the housing problem solving component. So I'm going to talk more about how um, if you're eligible for housing problem solving, the intention is that if you're not able to resolve their situation through our call center, they're able to go into the, um, to the shelter and provide housing problem solving. So the intention for housing problem solving there is to kind of keep them active for housing problem solving um, at the shelter for about 50 days. And if they're not able to resolve their situation, then we'll go ahead and close them out. Um, that's the shelter's... Uh, procedures right now with the county and the shelter, just keep them active for 50 days. Um, normally what would happen is that if it's over 50 days, generally our hotline would still support them and trying to get them housing problem solving if they did identify a location. Um, so here, what we have here is our workflow uh, for the shelter. Um, I've worked with the county on this to kind of create a workflow component. So basically is that um, once they identify, they do the documentation, um, they do all the paperwork, and then it's my responsibility and my end to kind of review the documentation since I'm the final approval for financial requests. Um, and then what we'll do is that if it's good to go, we, we complete it, and our check process for our end is within 24 to 48 hours to approve the check and then give it out to the landlord or family or friend or whoever uh, clients are we working with right now, okay? Um, Kind of benefits and effectiveness about housing problem solving, it is an immediate assistant, so we try to get them rapidly exit out of their current situation and get them housed. Um, it is also cost effective. I can say right off the bat, um, 
it costs about $55 to $145 a night at the, and the, um, at the shelter. And normally, generally, a client stays there around 60 to 90 days at the shelter. So it does help. Like, for example, like how Adrian had mentioned, is that like a Greyhound bus could cost 50 bucks, and we save a lot of money um, placing, placing the client back to where they're wanting to go to versus spending around like $5,000. And then right now, um, the county's running about 2,888 um, shelter beds um, at 95% capacity. Um, right now, we do have 10,000 people, uh, homeless individuals getting into shelters or just trying to find a solution. So housing problem solving is, a, is an option that we can try to resolve their situation a lot faster. Um, so yeah, um, and like right now, our wait lists and RN, we're, for example, we have like family, uh, single individuals. There are like uh, they take about two or three weeks before they get called for a shelter. Uh, family, especially right now, is a big thing for our county. Um, they're waiting about five to six weeks uh, to get into a shelter, a family shelter. So housing problem solving is the best way to do it. Um, some impact, some data here is that 40% of participants avoided exit, um, avoided homelessness. Um, about it takes generally, but for our hotline, it takes about 45 days. Um, based on the last data I had um, before I did come here, it took 24 days to get um, to get um, to avoid homelessness. Um, based on my last data, 10% um, have received financial assistance between um, $50 to about $2,000, and um, an average is like $1,500 um, every client that we work with. Um, and then the future for HP, uh, for housing problem solving is that we are expanding. We are working with shelters. We're working with an outreach team that uh, myself and the ca our county rep is, is kind of working with. So we're, we're trying to do more collaboration versus one, uh, one organization doing the whole thing. So we want to make sure that we are all collaborative in, in our community. Um, this pilot project is going to continue to 2025. Um, with University of Notre Dame, during this time frame, we are making changes to making sure that we can kind of help self -resol uh, help resolve the situation down in our county. And then, um, like I mentioned, is that um, we are working with Notre Dame University kind of kind of help that component. Okay. Thank you. Collaboration and coordination, that's what we want to hear. Um, last but not the least, Marie, take your floor. Thank you. I'm just going to move this. Sure. Set, so animations. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm so short. I can't see people <laughs> behind the laptop. Stand on the chair? <laughs> yeah, and risk falling. That would be perfect. How do I? Where's the mouse? Oh, there it is. Yeah, so you're gonna have to slide your presentation to the right. It's like, okay. imagine there's a second. Open it and then, oh, there it is. There you go. Hmm, that's strange. Um, so if you look at the screen, you can see where you're presenting. Okay. All right. Okay, my apologies if you can't see me, but I'm here. Um, my name is Marie Cecile Kodek. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Calgary's School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture. And today I'll be talking about my doctoral research on addressing anti-black racism in the housing and homelessness sector. And my research is ongoing with an anticipated completion date of June 2024. Wish me luck, I'm already panicking. <laughs> I have to, okay. So bear with me, I can't seem to figure out this shared split screen. The arrows on the keyboard might be easier. The keyboard, okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right, so my presentation today, I'll go through my presentation outline. I'll talk about the background, so why is this important and why should we be looking at this? I'll talk about the objectives of my research, the purpose, as well as the methodology and timeline. The past history, looking at Canadian black history to contextualize my research and my present, which is, I'll go, briefly go through results from my community engagement with key informants and black people with lived experience in the shelter system in Calgary. And then I'll talk about the future, my next steps, 
and end with some takeaways for you all. So the background of this really started with, I have been in the field for about 15 years in housing and homelessness. I've worked in frontline um, and then progressed to leadership positions. And I've recognized firsthand the challenges and the impacts of systemic anti-black racism on racialized communities, particularly black communities, and how nothing is really being done about it. We don't even really collect data on black experiences. And this isn't just in the housing sector, it's across sectors, and how this is really hurting the community and causing an overrepresentation. And that's the impact of this is that we're seeing an overrepresentation of black communities across sectors and negatively overrepresented. Over and this is really because of the framework that we are working from the worldviews, and it is really based on Eurocentric perspectives and worldviews that are being applied as a one-size-fits-all in our, in our sector. And this is really impacting individuals and communities that are non-white. So my research really creates an opportunity to introduce color to how we practice. It facilitates the paradigm shift and really raises our level of awareness of how colonial practices and have extensively impacted black communities. My research objective really aims to understand the impacts of anti-black racism on black Canadians. And when I say black Canadians, that also includes the African diaspora. I just, um, I'm lumping it into, into that. But it's also after understanding that and raising our level of awareness, what do we do about it? Well, my research aims to create a framework to address anti-black racism. And let me just say that it's not a framework that's gonna end racism in housing, but it's a framework to really heighten that level of awareness, to talk about why it's important for us to start review, looking at black people's experiences and how our practices have really failed to meet their needs. So it's not a fix all, but it's to raise awareness and get us on that path to addressing the issue. The purpose of my research is, again, I talked about raising awareness, but it's also to address discriminatory housing policies and practices. So this, this framework will be a strategic tool that could be applied to proposed and current policies and practices to identify how they impact black communities and also the adverse um, impacts that they could have. And so the framework is really meant to identify guiding principles to inform our approaches to addressing this issue in a collective way, in a proactive way, or in a collaborative way to also foster redress and continuous learning and knowledge sharing. My methodology. The framework really will be utilizing a number of methodologies, and this was really hard to identify a methodology given to, I was just speaking with my co-presenters talking about the gaps in research for black housing needs and really understanding the experiences of black Canadians. And there was a huge gap in literature. And so I tried to figure out what I could, what methodologies I could implement to ensure that it is Afrocentric and is centering the voices of black communities. And so I utilized three different methodologies. The first is design science research methodology, really because I'm in a design program and I'm kind of forced to use that, and, but it's really teaching me more about the design field. And also Afrocentric research methodology as well as autoethnographic research methodology. And using all these uh, methodologies, we will be oriented in lived experience where I'm consulting with black key informants who are experts in the field of addressing anti-black racism in their sector. So, I looked at different sectors and not housing because I know we haven't really been um, working on this issue, but I looked at different sectors like architecture, education, law, and also um, public service as well to really lean, glean more information and knowledge from them as to how to structure this framework. So I will be using five different phases for my methodology, and it really utilizes the design science research um, framework and approaches to addressing uh, research. And the first is the design or define phase. So this is an opportunity for, you to, for us to reflect on our work and identify gaps in the field. So after reflecting on my 15 years of experience, I identified the discriminatory practices that we use in our field, whether knowingly or unknowingly, but the impacts are on black communities. And so the problem space that I am exploring is anti-black racism in the housing sector. And the second is the analyze phase, and this is really community engagement, is to look at different stakeholders in the community that are experts in this field and to really learn more about what the challenges are. And so I conduct interviews with key informants lived experience folks in the shelter system, as well as have a community of practice stakeholder group really guiding me throughout this research process. 
The third phase is the design phase, which is really to gather this data that I now have and to reflect on it, to refine it and develop my framework. So the first iteration of the framework. And then what I really like about this approach is that I go back to my co-creators, so the people that I consulted with, to really gain concluding feedback from them. Did I actually meet what you talked about or am I completely out to lunch on this one? So it's an opportunity for them to give me feedback as to if this is the right direction, if this is something that's going to be, um, that would help move this, this issue forward and to resolve in it. And the fourth stage is testing phase, which is really to test and evaluate the, uh, the framework. And as a consultant, I'm required to test this in my practice on projects. So I'm, I'm testing my first iteration of the framework on projects to identify, is this actually working and how do I um, tweak it before I finally finalize it and have it written as my, my thesis. And that would be next year. So, Looking at the past, some people might ask, why, why are we going back to history? Well, first off, we are not being, we're not being taught black history in Canada. And there is a lack of knowledge as to what has happened in the past and how that continues to be perpetuated currently and how it continues to further marginalize black communities. So to remain true to Afrocentric research methodologies, I, with specific emphasis on Sankofa, I had to delve into the past to really understand the events that have happened to black communities and how that continues to impact them today. The first is the first African in Canada, what is now known as Canada, arrived in the 1600s. And I mention this because in the field, I noticed that there have always been this misconception that every black person is a recent immigrant or refugee to Canada without the real realization that there have been black people here since the 1600s. And this is all they know. Canada is the only country that they know and they're not really connected to the continent of Africa. So that's important to state. And the second event that really had a major impact on black Canadians is slavery in Canada. Um, a lot of people don't know that there was slavery in Canada. They look to the States and say <laughs> that it happened there and not here. However, there, is, there was slavery in Canada and it continued to have negative impacts. It was abolished in, in 1834 by the British Parliament. However, the discrimination faced by black people continue to persist and really underlines the failure of emancipation to bring about equality to local people of African descent. Racial segregation. I was actually sh surprised at this, and, but it was, it's pretty clear that there was racial segregation here in Canada and it really fostered the exclusion of black people and prevented black people from accessing various services such as housing, employment, um, healthcare, justice, even commercial establishments. And the last segregated school in Canada closed in 1983 here in Nova Scotia. Immigration. The Canadian government implemented an Immigration Act in 1910, barring black people from immigrating into Canada. And this was really in response to the vigorous campaigning from white men and women to really keep Canada white and prevent different races, other races from coming into Canada. And up until 1967, the Canadian Immigration Act changed. As a planner, it was very important for me to understand my field and what role my field has played in in segregating and marginalizing black communities. And I found that urban planning has really, has, a his, has historically and systematically played a role in racially segregating and displacing racialized communities in Canada, as we've seen with um, reserves for indigenous people and social high population of black people in social housing. Zoning bylaws and restrictive covenants have really relegated racialized people to specific areas, segregating people and also building inequities into our housing system. And redlining occurred in Canada, and actually now we're in, Nova, in, in Halifax. Africville is actually a prime example of redlining. So stories from the shelter. It was really important for me to interview people that were experiencing homelessness in the shelter. And this is something I, I had a little wrestling match with my university because they didn't think that that was important. But because I'm from the social service field, I talked about how it's very important to center their voices because as we know, when we do develop policies or plans, we don't usually engage people with lived experience and that has to change. So as we saw the history of, of black people in Canada, it's really marked by ongoing racial inequities that continue to persist in 
present times through various policies and practices. And black people are really disproportionately overrepresented across sector. And so the following slides really talk about the experiences of black people in the shelter system, really highlighting the pervasive nature of anti-black racism across sectors that have created pathways to housing stability for black Canadians. I interviewed about seven black people with lived and living experiences, and they revealed that they have had a racist encounters across the, um, sectors, and that, have, that has really created pathways uh, into housing instability and sometimes a direct link into homelessness for them. The first is the justice system. The black people in the shelter system really reported instances of racial discrimination and profiling by police when they're in public areas. They shared that police usually tend to view them as criminals, leading to illegal searches and even detentions up to 24 hours. Unfortunately, as we know, racial profiling is a, is an, a clear example of systemic racism and also um, personal biases and prejudices towards black folks. And black individuals are disproportionately impacted by um, racial profiling. And what was also shared was that these practices have resulted in black individuals being targeted, arrested, and charged with offenses, even if they haven't committed any crimes. And this, and this can now lead to criminal record, making it challenging for them to sustain meaningful employment. And what happens if you can't sustain meaningful employment? Of course, you cannot sustain affordable, suitable, adequate housing for yourself. So there is a um, domino effect there. The next is education. Participants shared their experiences of anti-black racism in the educational institutions. They stated that teachers tend to impose negative stereotypes on black children, and the students have felt that they were treated uh, differently than their white counterparts. They also talked about how the result is that it leads to a higher dropout rate, lower chances of attending college, and also fuels the uh, school to prison pipeline, which also creates difficulties in accessing housing as adults. Employment. During my interviews, participants, all the participants actually shared uh, experiences with anti-black discrimination in the workplace and the impacts that this has had on them. As an individual shared this story, they talked about how they've worked with youth and the, the youth would usually call them racial slur, and, but being the only black person at the place, they didn't feel comfortable, they didn't have anyone to talk to about it. So this issue went unresolved and impacted their mental health, which of course impacted their job satisfaction and led them to lose their, um, their job and then their housing, unfortunately. So that is something that happened across the board with the participants that I spoke to. Healthcare. During an interview with a participant, a direct link was really established between the discrimination this individual faced in the healthcare by access, trying to access mental health services. The individual was really grappling with mental health challenges and tried repeatedly to access mental health support. And unfortunately, they always felt that they were misunderstood or dismissed. And for instance, the individual talked about how they tried to access this mental health worker and did not feel understood. And what would be helpful is someone who understands their background. Unfortunately, this individual's untreated mental health challenge led them to lose their job and then ultimately lose their apartment, landing them in the emergency shelter for the first time. And this was a 20-year-old individual. They attributed the, their experiences to the lack of representation and advocacy in the mental health system. Housing. We've heard a lot about housing discrimination. Of course, this wasn't a surprise um, coming out from my research, was that all the individuals talked about housing discrimination when accessing um, housing. Some individuals shared that it's hard to exit the, the shelter system when you face uh, discrimination. So for instance, some of them shared that in the shelter system, the housing workers are usually busy, overwhelmed, and lack capacity to help them. So they are tasked with going out and getting the apartment themselves without the resources. They don't have phones, they don't have computers, so how are they supposed to search for apartments? So they go out and look for apartments, and usually when the landlords see them and they're black, they're told that, sorry, the uh, apartment is rented. Or or if they get past that first hurdle, they're asked where they live, and when they report that they live in the shelter, the landlord says, sorry, I can't rent to you. And also source of income has been, has been um, described as another form of discrimination for black participants. So what we've seen here is that these stories from the shelter really highlight the discriminatory practices black communities face due to institutional failures and systemic inequities, and it has really resulted in a higher rate of um, homelessness and housing stability for black Canadians. 
So now key informants guiding principles. So when talking to the key informants, I asked them, well, what should I include in this framework? And they all talked about how we have to hide, have guiding principles to guide our practice. And this is something that we also talk about in the design field is what is guiding, what are your value system that guides your practice? And so key informants talked about how we have to identify guiding principles that are reflective of the value systems of African communities. And some of this include black history, the knowledge of black history. We just talked about how there is a lack of knowledge about black history in Canada and how <laughs> that has continued to perpetuate the inequities that we're experiencing today. And acknowledge and address anti-black racism. We have done a good job in denying that racism exists, but we really need to address it head on. We really need to um, acknowledge that it exists, recognize it, and confront the systemic racism, implicit biases, and microaggressions that continue to be perpetuated in how we practice in our policies and programs. Human rights. Human rights has been something that has mentioned quite a lot, especially when black individuals experience discrimination based on their race. That is a pro protected guide and that ground rather, but and that has to be approached with, we have to really approach it with the perspective that these individuals, despite their race or their gender, whatever it is, they have the right to housing. Black centering, this is a concept that came up a lot in my research, and it really talks about prioritizing the experiences, the worldviews, and the perspectives of black Canadians. And really, by centering on their experiences, we can better understand how racism and inequities impact black communities. Disaggregated race-based data. This one really, this is one of my biggest pet peeves, and it's something that I've I, I really encountered in my research is the lack of data, and especially disaggregated race-based data. We don't collect really data on black people. We lump them into racialized communities or other and unknown when we're collecting data, and this has really impacted them, and we really need to be gathering and evaluating disaggregated race-based data to for it to provide valuable insights and for it to also educate us on what the needs of black communities are. Intersectionality, I'm sure we've heard about intersectionality. It really shows how overlapping oppression can severely impact individuals in multiple marginalized groups. And as we already talked about housing discrimination, how people that, were, um, that belonged to the black race, but also low income and maybe gender, how those can overlap and cause um, more challenges for individuals seeking housing. Strength-based, this was already talked about, um, how we should approach this using a strength-based approach because black housing equities, we can re leverage strengths and resources within black communities to really create sustainable solutions. And it also recognizes the rich history of resilience and self-determination that's possessed by black communities. Love-centered, this actually, again, I wasn't expecting for a key informant to talk about love because it's not, I guess, it's, not, it's just not something that, um, that I've, I've come across in my research. However, it is, this really grounds everything because when we look at what's happening across the world, there is not a lot of love, but a lot of hate. So we really need to approach things from a love-based approach. And it's really an acknowledgement that these struggles that black communities are facing are rooted in systemic oppression and historical trauma, making this approach more, um, <laughs> Making it crucial to approach the issue with empathy and understanding. And of course, trauma-informed. It's understanding that um, racism and discrimination has a far-reaching impact, and we need to understand that uh, individuals have suffered a lot of trauma, and we need to be approaching it from, from that area. And of course, accountability. It's really understanding that we need to hold policymakers, decision makers accountable to to addressing this issue, and we have to have metrics to evaluate our work. The Black Housing Equity Framework, and that's what I'm calling this uh, framework, it will really act as a strategic tool designed to address the institutional and systemic barriers black individuals face in the housing sector and offer guiding principles as well as operational prompts to assist decision makers, policy makers, housing practitioners to create more equitable housing solutions and programs that address the needs of black communities. The next step is I'm currently designing the framework, and now I will take it back to my co-creators for them to give their concluding feedback, and then I'll move to the testing and evaluating stage before I document and hopefully graduate. And hopefully Annika will be there so she can force me to graduate on time. <laughs> <laughs> Takeaways. <laughs> Thank you.
takeaways, there is an emergent need to address anti-black racism, as we've seen. And we've, re we've realized that anti-black racism is really embedded across sector and every fiber of society. And this is really impacting black Canadians' housing experiences. And there is also a lack of culturally appropriate services and representation and advocacy in our field that's causing these barriers. And anti-black systemic racism acts as a pathway to housing stability and homelessness. Thank you. <laughs> the power of intimidation it never fails I used to be a teacher many years ago so I still have those techniques um, please a big round of applause for our brilliant presenters you can hate me but you cannot ignore me uh, we have about 17 minutes for questions so now it's yours not mine I had a couple questions. One is for the, the panel from California. The, the, the impact that you had was immense, and I was wondering about the amount of staff required to do the work in the different uh, circumstances, in the different areas that you work in. Yeah, so right now we have around ten, st um, sorry, eight staff that are doing housing problem solving in our call center. Um, and the shelter right now, I'm not too sure exactly how many they have uh, from what I got from the county, from our end, is that they have around six or seven staff um, at each site. So generally for our end, we would we normally have initial eight staff working with them when they call in and they are eligible for housing problem solving. Okay, so that how much of your budget, I guess that was the back in my mind, yeah. is toward the cost of labor to, in order to do the service that you do? On top of my head, I'm not too sure. Um, generally, I think it would be around um, 150k to to do all the staffing component. Um, but for our budget for our housing problem solving financial component, we have about 1.5 that we spend. We spend. We, we can spend. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Do I need to go to the mic, or should I? If you have a teacher voice, use it. <laughs> um, my question is for the, I assume it's the second presenter, um, in regards to the Wales case study that you provided um, with respect to um, funds that are made available uh, in the event that uh, tenants have to be uh, evicted from the property in the event that there is some property deficiencies. I wonder, um, if you can answer, like, are what role then does the does the landlord have in terms of if they could either refuse to take that money, or, or, and also is accepting that money uh, comes with conditions in regards to um, keeping the tenant housed for the long term and not just for uh, the for seal, uh, for the short term. Uh, that's an awesome question and I appreciate it because one thing that came out of our data was the relationship with landlords. The majority of the programs that we saw, not just the Welsh one, but majority of them, the funds go directly to the landlord. So it's not given to the tenant to then pay it. So often if service providers have to negotiate with the landlord saying, okay, we're going to pay for these repairs or we're going to pay these rent arrears. You have to tell us you're not evicting these people. Sometimes it's just on word, depending on the program. It'll be like, we have your word, you're going to keep this person housed. And then there's other places in the world where that's actually like once that paper is signed, the tenant can bring that to court in the event that the landlord evicts them anyways. And the judge will withhold, they'll, they'll prevent the eviction from happening if that paper has been signed. So it depends on the jurisdiction. but. Generally speaking, when it comes to more things like, okay, you need your fire escape fixed, it's often enough on like, a, thank you, okay, uh, please don't evict the person. Um, and a lot of service providers, I'd say globally, have been saying to us, so much of our work is just negotiating with landlords because this was an opportunity for them to evict somebody they didn't want living there. Does that answer your question a bit? Yes, but I think the, the, the other point that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at is knowing that any funds that is put towards to, you know, improving the efficiencies of the property helps to increase the value of the property. So, 
I, I'm trying to I'm trying to ensure that there are conditions that are put in place to ensure that taxpayers are getting the best return on their investment into a private rental property. Yeah, you would think that there would be more measures in place to ensure that these units continue to house people um, and not just contribute to the value of that unit. If we have any evidence of that's actually the investment that's being made, I'd love to see it. Um, I'm, I'm very critical of this in the same spirit as you are, is, is that is this a, just a gentrifying factor that we're labeling as homelessness prevention? I don't know, um, but service providers, generally speaking, when it comes to like more flex funds, like things where you can be like, I'm gonna do some repairs, um, are quite popular and they say that those are often of the funds that keep people housed more than funds that keep, like that just pay people's rent arrears. Um, it's a fund that says, okay, we're gonna keep this person housed by any means possible. So again, I, I think it goes back to my point, we need more evidence, but I'm with you, I'm, I'm critical of it.